What's happening, everyone? I'm Kyle Draper, host of Kings Pre and Post Game Live. I also serve as play by play announcer for the Sacramento Kings. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this great program that we have. It is called Perspective, a conversation with Tyrese Halliburton and Glenn Robinson III. Over the next half hour, 45 minutes to an hour or so, we're going to jump into a number of different topics. What it's like being a black man in America. We'll also talk about athletes using not only their voices, but their actions to enter and enact change in the United States of America. And also the public's role in building empathy. You know, I always say that, you know, uh, race relations and improving race relations isn't just an African-American problem. It isn't just a minority problem. It's a United States problem. It's an all of us problem. And so I'm hoping over the next hour or so that we'll dive into some of your questions as well, leave them out there in the chat. But we'll also hear from Tyce, Tyrese and Glenn about what it's like being a young black man in America, what it's like being a professional athlete in America. And hopefully we can begin the conversation moving closer to change to enact some change. And, and without further ado, let me introduce our guest for today's panel. First of all, GR3, I got to go with him first, Tyrese, because he is the OG of the group. He is the veteran on the squad, Glenn Robinson III. Thanks for joining us. And also the reigning Western Conference Rookie of the Year, Tyrese Halliburton, joining me here, guys, on Perspective. And, and fellas, we're going to dive right into it, and we're going to get to some very important discussions. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, this will, will be a personal discussion for us, sort of like a roundtable where we share our experiences and, and what we want others to take away from it. And, and so, GR3, I'll start with you, man. Just open it right up. What do you think is this the status of race relations in our country right now? How do you think things stand at this very moment in the United States? Yeah, uh, appreciate you having us. You know, I think uh, at this moment in the U.S., you know, where we stand is um, we're in the midst of a lot of chaos, a lot of adversity. Um, everyone has seen what's going on throughout the past months. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough I have a daughter and it's for her to be able to see um, you know, a Madam Vice President, a, a Lady uh, Vice President, it means a lot. You know, I know for me, I'm very excited about what's to happen next, you know, just because she'll be six, seven, you know, seeing, um, uh, you know, the Vice President like that. So I think it's a lot of chaos going on. Um, but at Miss, we can't forget about everything that has happened. Um, and we have to continue to move forward and do the best that we can. Um, and I think that, you know, we don't need to let any of these movements and things that we've done to gain a lot of progress uh, stop. What about you, Tyrese? What do you think is the current state of race relations in our country? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're in somewhat of a transition. Um, you know, I think the last four years in our country, um, you know, I feel like people who are, you know, feel some type of way about people of other color, um, in other words, racist human beings, um, you know, I feel like it was more um, acceptable for them to come out. You know, I felt like they felt more empowered in the last four years than they have in a long time in the sense of that they could come out and be who they really are and not face consequences, right? With everything that was, that uh, transpired in our country. And I feel like now we got, um, you know, a, a new, uh, all, all new group of people in, in office. Uh, I feel like we're transitioning to hopefully better days. You know, I, I like to have hope that, you know, better things are ahead. I mean, obviously, those people don't just disappear, right? I think, um, I think with new people coming in office, it it changes uh, how open people can be about it. But I, I still feel like it's it's here, you know. It, it didn't just disappear. So uh, I think the biggest hope is that with all the conversations that have been created in the past 12 months, that we continue to create those conversations and continue to address what needs to be addressed at all times. And I feel like the more we do that as a country, the better that uh, that that we can be not only for people of color, but for everybody as a whole. And, and Tyrese, I, I want to start right there because, you know, I, I was thinking about it earlier today and, and I'm thinking about Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and, and one day where his sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters can live in a country. And I thought for a while, guys, we were moving in that direction. Do you feel like we've sort of taken a step back, uh, uh, Tyrese? And, and, and how frustrating is that? Because I'm frustrated by it. To be this last year, and if you want to say this last four years, it, it's been frustrating to see us, in, in my opinion, maybe regress a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that statement. Um, 
you know, I think there's been a lot of things that have happened in my lifetime um, alone that uh, shows that we still have a long way to go, right? Uh, today is Trayvon Martin's, would be Trayvon Martin's 26th birthday. And uh, that's important to me because I remember being 11, 12 years old when he was uh, murdered and how that was kind of the first time that, um, you know, everything that's going, that the first time that I really learned about it, you know, the first time that it, it was real. It wasn't just something I read about in the book that, uh, you know, slavery and the civil rights movement, it was real now, like it was, it was happening, you know? So I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like, I still feel like there's so much to go. I mean, I, I agree with your statement that we have probably regressed a little bit because of, you know, who was in office and, um, you know, the, the, the past four years have been obviously very poor for, for our country, but I, I do feel like, um, you know, there's, there's still a lot to go and I don't, I don't feel like I, we had an African American in, in office and that's very exciting. And I think everybody was, was, um, uh, that was a great time for everybody, but there's, there's always been somewhere to go. And I feel like there always will be, uh, somewhere to go. What about you, Glenn? You, you, you hopeful? I mean, it, it, it is the, the current events and everything that's going on right now in our political system, are you hopeful about the way we're heading right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. You know, I, I think that um, it's good signs. You know, I think that if you ask my mom, you ask my grandma, you know, our elders, um, they might not have seen, uh, think they might not have thought that they would see a black president, a black vice president. Um, so, you know, when it comes to, to waves of things in this generation making that happen, I think that um, that's very hopeful. I think that the thing is, you know, um, collectively, is how do we come together uh, to get to get us out of this situation as well? Um, collectively stepping up, you know, uh, as 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 this race and knowing that we can accomplish a lot of things together and we have to do it together. Um, you know, systems that's been put in place, things have never been put in place. Uh, for us to succeed um, and, and and I think that that's the biggest thing is knowing that uh, we can do it together and trying to start to, to continue to do that instead of and uplifting each other you know instead of putting each other down yeah no doubt about it uh, positivity lifting each other up uh, that, that's definitely key uh, I, I guess I, I want to start too by asking you guys your, your NBA players you got a lot going on in your lives no doubt about it but one thing I've seen from athletes Glenn is they aren't afraid to speak up. And, and so I'll start with you. Why was it important for you to take part in an event like today's? I think it's important because uh, my morals, you know, who I am, um, who my mom and dad, you know, taught me to be and, and raised me to be, you know, and, and um, you know, unfortunately I've been, I'm from Indiana, I'm from Gary, Indiana. Um, and, and I've been in a situation where, you know, as soon as I got drafted, um, I had my car, um, and I, I got my three friends in the car with me and we get pulled over, you know, just leaving it, leaving a gas station, um, you know, and, and we were in a better part of town, a white area, I'll say, and they pulled us over uh, just because we left the store and, and, and a black guy was driving a Porsche, you know, so um, a situation is every day, you know, luckily they found out who I was, we were fine, but a situation is every day that happened like that where unfortunately, uh, people don't come out of it on the good side, you know, um, they're, they're held to a different standard. Um, and, and, and it's very upsetting, you know, because if I hadn't have been drafted, who knows what would have happened, you know, um, along with my friends. If I wasn't in that car with my friends, all three of them probably would have got uh, locked up or, or even worse, you know. So um, uh, dealing with personal things and, and throughout life as you get, get older, uh, some things frustrate you. But like I said, um, moving in a better direction and trying to move in a way um, to correct some of those mistakes. How about you, Ty? Yeah, I, I think uh, Glenn made something really, well, really uh, good there was about his morals, right? I think me, as the past 12 months and all the time of the pandemic, I've kind of looked in the mirror and thought to myself, what are my morals? You know, like, what what is important to me? And I think one of the, I think the most important thing to me is, is uh, basic human rights, right? Like, basic equal rights for everybody, every person, no matter you know, race, uh, religion, skin color, uh, gender, anything, right? I, I think that's more important to me than anything. So I feel like me, not only as an athlete, what I stand for and what's most important to me is right. just equality. You know, so anytime that I see something that's not equal that's going on, I feel like it's, I have to speak up because I have a platform that uh, there are people who 
who follow me and and look, you know, listen to me. And I hope as I get older, there are, there are kids that look up to me, you know. So um, yeah, I'm just going to continue to do that. And I feel like it has a lot to do with how I was raised, um, but also just um, of what's important. Yeah, and, and I want to applaud you guys because, you know, it, it, you guys have been definitely outspoken on some of the issues uh, going on in our country. You know, the safe play would be just to chill, right, and, and not speak out. You know, just worry about your home, your, your, you know, what's going on in your house and, and, and not put yourself out there. But, you know, we, we're seeing athletes more and more actually speak out because it, it, you guys are, are more than basketball players. You're human beings, you know. It, it, you have emotions. You have feelings. And I, I believe you guys do want to see uh, this country move to a better place. Uh, Glenn, let, let, let's talk about, you know, something you mentioned being pulled over after you got drafted. Uh, tell us about your upbringing and, and just what it is to be black in America right now. Yeah, um, you know, growing up in, in Gary, Indiana, um, you know, it's mostly black town. Um, going to high school, I, I went to a school where it was a, a mixture of races, you know, so I had to learn how to talk to white people. I had to learn how to present myself um, around around white people. Um, you know, I, I got some friends who are white, you know, and, and I think that it, it just really um, it made me realize, you know, both sides, you know, there are some good white people. You know, when you grow up in a town of mostly black, uh, like I said before, my mom and grandma growing up there as well, they didn't really see too many white people, you know? And I think that um, with that being said, coming out of there and meeting some of those folks, like it's okay, you know? And, and, and I do have a lot of friends who are white. So I would say growing up made me realize that, um, you know, both 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 sides are okay. Both races are okay. It's yeah. how do we interact? How do we get along? How do we treat each other with that respect? Um, and when that respect is lost, um, then that's when you see kind of controversy. So I would say, growing up though, um, in America right now, it, it's tough. You know, it's tough. And, and and having a young daughter and having to teach her the same things that my mom taught me: um, hold the wheel with two hands when you get pulled over. Uh, don't don't reach for anything else. You know that. The things that, that most of us know and we're taught um, to have to pass that down generation to generation, that's trauma right there, um, let alone uh, the trauma that we already face, you know, as, as black, our black people. Um, and, and that's the most upsetting part because we got so much trauma that we go through every day because of um, slavery, the way that we treat it, the way that we taught our education system, um, the food that we eat. Uh, so everything, water. Right. So it's water, tough growing up yeah. right now in America. And I think that is very, um, people don't really realize it, you know, and I think that that's the importance of um, Ty Tyree speaking up, myself speaking up as professional athletes and getting out of that comfort zone um, to where we're speaking up for those who can't, you know, because I know a lot of my friends, a lot of people from the hood that want to tell people these things that need help and can't get it. I mean, you, you hit on something near and dear to my heart, Glenn. I mean, I, we've all been pulled over and, and I remember I was driving uh, when I lived in Massachusetts, man, late at night, I got off work, 11, 30, 12, quiet little streak. I pulled over by the police. And the first thing I did was call my wife because I felt like I needed somebody as sort of a witness just in case anything went down, you know? And, and, and it's crazy in, in 2020, 2021, Tyrese, that we still have to think like that. And I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I want people to understand this is the stuff we have to think about, you know? Uh, imagine, you know, Glenn has a two-year-old daughter. Imagine having to explain to her as she gets older, you know, how to interact with the police, you know, how, how to be civil out there in the world, how people will judge you for the color of your skin, Tyrese. And so I think it's just a shame that here we are in 2021, and we're still really having the same conversations our parents had back in the day, right? We have to have these same conversations, Tyrese. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. I think uh, for me, you know, I'm, I'm biracial, right? I have a white mom, a black dad, uh, grew up in a predominantly white area. Um, so I, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like I had it better than a lot of people in my area because of my athletic ability, right? I feel like that I was kind of put on a pedestal at a young age uh, as, a, you know, as a good athlete. So I felt like uh, I had it better at a, at a sense and i feel wrong even saying that but it, it's truly how i feel right um i just feel like I, I was given not given more but just put on a pedestal and, and it's been it's been um you know different for me because i've grown 
with two two you know sides of the family where when I go and visit my dad's side of the family, right? It's a it's a completely different world, right? It's a completely different world than when I'm home, right? Like uh, the my main thing is kind of the way that at, at a young age, the first thing I noticed was like just the way that everybody was talking, right? Like I knew when I go when I got around my black my black family that I, and there were certain things I could say <laughs> I could say around my, my white family, my white friends, right? So it, it's something I learned at a young age, and I feel like I have had a not a not an advantage. That's not the right word I'm looking for, but I benefited from having to have to be in kind of two different worlds in a sense. So you know, be for me, it's it's a little different than than others. But I just feel like being biracial, you have that sense of being a part of both worlds, you know. And I feel like I sometimes, I right, you you might face you know prejudice and racism from white people, but I feel like sometimes even black people give me a hard time because I am am part white as well, you know. I. I I feel like that that I've had both of those, so it it is it is a little crazy and a little different for me. But I feel like that's helped shape me into who I am is being able to be on yes. both sides of the spectrum. But at, at the end of the day, uh, I'm a black man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, no matter what, if it came down to it, white people see me as a black man. You know, so that that right. that's important than anything. You, you, you know, mom and grandma it, always, mom and yeah. grandma always say, if your dad black, you you black. Yeah, yeah. And and, and Glenn Tyrese brought up a a, a good point. I feel like when I'm around my black friends, you talk one way, but then when you get in a different setting, and and these are the kind of things that I want people to think about because, you know, being black in America to me means you're sort of having to, you know, live almost a double life to an extent. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, uh, like Tyree said, when you're around your, your black friends, you're in the hood, you're with your guys in the neighborhood, it's one thing. You get in the corporate setting, you're around white people, it's another thing. And, and so that's things that, you know, we have to just deal with, I guess, uh, growing up. You know, I, I, it, it's funny because Marcus Smart of the Celtics, he said recently, you know, he plays a game. There are people in the stands wearing his jersey, but when he leaves the arena, there was a time where he walked across the street and somebody called him the N-word. You know, as athletes, Glenn, do you feel, I guess, insulated at all? Or once you take off that jersey and leave the arena, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, you're just another black person. Yeah, I mean, I would say that statement is very true. I would say that uh, it comes with both. You know, I think that it's times where uh, you'll be put on a pedestal, like like Ty is saying, and um, you know when you put on that jersey, or when people see you, they might know you and treat you differently, um, even though you're black, but you're an athlete, and and that's where uh, it's kind of frustrating to me just to know that um, if we didn't if we didn't do what we did, if we didn't shoot a basketball for a living, um, who knows what our life would be like? You know, that's just that's the reality of it, and that's the craziness of this of this world and of this country um, that we're in right now. You know, and I, I've been in situations like that, too. You take off the jersey, you leave the arena, um, you know, and, 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 and things can just get handled in a different way. Um, so I think that is, is definitely some truth in that. Right. I want to get to a question. Uh, you know, people are leaving questions and comments in our chat. Uh, if you want these guys to answer any of your questions, just leave them in the uh, chat there. Uh, somebody asked uh, Tyrese, how do you think the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King has affected this country oh wow that, that's a great question yeah, that's a good one right i think there's the the biggest part to me about the speech right is that uh growing up and even today you know when it's black history month when it's martin luther king day right there's always that same excerpt they show from the speech right they take that same excerpt right and and i've always wondered like why don't i hear anything else about it I, that speech means that, that speech means a lot to me because I, I still think that it rings true, right? I still think that if Martin were alive, right, he would he would uh, be happy that uh, that his 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 kids and his grandkids are allowed to be in the same classes as white people, right? They are allowed to uh, go to the same restaurants, drink from the same water fountain, right? But I, I still think that he would he if he was still here, I think that he would also say there's still a way to go, right? We're still not. We're, we're still not where we're still not at the perfect spot, right? There's still a way to go. I think the biggest thing that I think anybody could, when when you hear that speech, I, I encourage people to please, please go listen to the whole speech, 
go listen to the whole speech because he said a lot of things that that the masses of America took out, right? Because it hit on hit things right on the head, and they took that out because they wanted it to just have these little parts. But he spoke about so much more than just that. So I, I that speech means a lot to me. And throughout the you know these last twelve months, I've had the ability to go back and listen to the whole thing. But I just encourage you to listen to the whole thing because I still think there's a lot to it that uh, many many people in our world still still can learn from. You know, what's frustrating to me, Glenn, as I think about it, when Martin Luther King was alive, he had death threats all the time, you know? You, you, you think about, you know, some of our most iconic civil rights leaders and what they had to go through. Let's throw Muhammad Ali in there also. And now 30, 40, 50 years later, we look back. And so how do we as a current society embrace, you know, the civil rights movement, embrace social justice issues now, where we see so many people saying athletes should just shut up and dribble. You know, it's there's a saying, be on the correct side of history. And, and how important is that now? Because we see it with Martin Luther King, man, he was jailed many times, death threats, Muhammad Ali, you know, Malcolm X, like whoever you want to bring up. But yet those guys were on the right side of history. I would imagine you athletes right now are on the correct side of history as well. And so how important is it, I think, uh, do you think, f to be on the correct side of history for not only yourselves, but the people at home watching this right now, too? Yeah, I know for, for me, um, you know, and just getting to know Ty over the last months, like for both of us, I know it, it means um, probably so much more than, than just basketball to us, you know, and I think that that's why we're on this call now. That's why we do things in the community and try to help um, is because we know that we can't have some effect on this. You know, millions of people watch us. And I think one of the things that that's so important is that it's, it's how you raise, you know, and um, everyone is raised differently. Uh, but if we could have some type of a outside effect on some of those that, that might not be raised as, as well, um, you know, and I think that that's part of our job and part of our mission. And to be able to do that takes a real man. It takes you, you have to be brave. Um, everyone's not going to like it, and it's okay for everyone not to like it. Um, and I think that that's definitely why I do it and try to help, you know, the, the, the people that I can um, and just try to get try to get justice and try to get um, people to realize that, you know, this is bigger than basketball. This is, this is our lives, you know. This is um, how we live and generations to come after us, you know, and it's, I think it's just so much bigger than us. You know, we can even imagine where the NBA can be um, you know, in the next five to 10 years. And, and, and after that, you know, what it's going to look like, um, you know, and, and, and with most of us being black, you know, I think that um, doing these things are just as important than ever. Yeah, Ty, I mean, as an athlete, you know, what kind of change do you think, what kind of impact do you think you can have out there? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like if, I feel like we're in the best time probably ever in terms of, you uh, the, our ability to reach people, right, through the age of social media and, and, and things like that, to TV and, and all that stuff. I feel like we're in probably the greatest era to be able to do that, right, to, act, you know, so far in life that we are able to, people are able to see us, interact with us through social media and, and all those things. So I feel like it's important for us to, to, to take a stand, not only for for us now, but those who came before us and those who will come after us, Right. right? I, I always think about when people are asking uh, about money, right? Let's let's just let's throw a race out of the car. Let's just talk about money. Like people talking to me about money, they're like, you know, how important is, you know, like uh, like how are you gonna spend your money? Like it ain't about me. Like the money I'm making right now is not about me. It's about my my grandkids and their kids, right? Like I, I want to put my family in a better situation. Just like with now putting race back into it and putting you know equal rights. What I want to, how I want to impact change is how I want, I want my grandkids to, have a, to live a better life for my great grandkids and, and down the line, right? Just like those who came before me, like even, right. I mean, all the way, you can go all the way back to you know Muhammad Ali and, and Malcolm X and and Martin Luther King, but you can go back as as short as like Colin Kaepernick, right? Like I I, I was sixteen, right, right. I was 15, 16 years old when he when he decided to take a knee, right? And that had a big impact on my life because. Not only like that showed me like he was he was willing to give give it all up, right? You know he, they got they put him out the league, 
And now everybody's taking a knee, right? It's, it's yeah. like it's common. You know, like people in the NFL are all taking a knee. We're taking a knee at games, and we're not getting no punishment from it. But he, he took the fall for us. So I, I, I can't you – can't, you can't sit there and watch that and allow that to happen and not be willing to, you know, also create change and also have an impact on things. Yeah, Glenn, how important, I guess, and, and, and how comforting is it to know that the NBA has your back on issues like this? Yeah, um, you know, I think out of all professional sports, you know, we, we accomplish the most and do the best, you know, when it comes to things like this. Um, you know, I remember even, even when I first came to the league, uh, you know, the dress code, um, when that got implemented versus other sports. Um, you know, and even a, even a way that we're we're able to dress now, and where we're able to show um, our unique style of who we are, um, and do different things like that. Uh, the NBA just opens and allows us to be ourselves. You know, and I think that that's the biggest thing um, that that separates us. You know, and and when we talk about different cultures, and people want to see that. You know, people have to um, have access to us at some level and and be able to see uh, what we're about. You know, what our culture is, and I think that we can even. Uh, could just continue to do a better job of that. But I think uh, to players and to us at the NBA, uh, to have that, that backing, you know, by the NBA, by our Players Association, uh, that means everything to us. Now, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about white privilege, uh, guys. You know, it, when, when you say white privilege, you know, for some people, the hair stands up on the back of their neck. They, they tiptoe around it. So, Tyrese, I'll let you start us off. What, what does white privilege mean to you? Um, I think it's a systematic issue that uh, is what our country was built by. That's, that's truly how, how I feel. Um, you know, I think you had uh, men sit down and write a Declaration of Independence and say all men are equal and then go and own slaves, right? Like, there, there's a, a, a lot of, you know, like bigotry there. And it's crazy uh, the hypocrisy that that is that's within that, and I, I think it's it's within everything, right? Like when I when I think of white privilege, I think of honest like everything you could think of. It's there, right? Like housing discrimination, right? Like like it's it's in our housing. It's in mass incarceration. Go look in the in the prison and see how what's the difference between uh, somebody to a black person and a white person have the same offense. How much more likely it is that the black person gets a worse sentence, right? Like it, it's in everything, and it, and I, I, it's hard for me because like I, I am I am part white, so so people think that I benefit from 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 that. I benefit from that because I'm white, and and, and that's that's not what it is. It, it, it I, I we try not to say it and be offensive, right? I think that was the thing is like people tried to shy away from that term because they didn't want to be offensive. But I think if there's anything in the last 12 months. It's the we have to have these ugly conversations, right? They, they have to be had to, to create change. And I think the more that we talk about that and the more people are willing to accept that and understand that, not get offended and not listen and then and then the conversation gets ugly, right? Like I think you have to be open ears and come on and listen. And I think uh, that it's it's very easy to see that it's very prevalent in our society. What about you, Glenn? White privilege. Yeah. I I agree with Ty. You know, I, I think that um, it just shows what our country was was kind of built off on and off of um, the the morals and systems that we believe to be they believe to be correct and okay um, until things that that they like that were taken away. You know, um, things that they felt uh, weren't right, and and now we hear a lot more about it and, and people talking about white privilege, but. Um, to me, is something that, you know, obviously shouldn't have been um, away in a sense um, ever, you know. So um, it's something that's very uh, upsetting. You know, I think that, like Ty said, it, it comes from mass incarceration to you can see it in, in our education system. You can see it in, in like I said uh, earlier, our food, you know, the food that we eat, the, the differences in our community. So, um, you know, it's a very it's a very tough subject to talk on and to speak on. And like you said, people get a little um, weird when you start talking about these type of situations, but these are the talks that we, that, like Ty said, we have to have in order to move forward, you know, and understand right. that it's okay to have this communication. And that's the only way that we can progress um, because, you know, most, most white people would probably never under, fully understand us, you know, and, and for them to be able to start, they have to start somewhere, you know, and, and for them to be able to learn, they have to start somewhere. So um, that's, that's my take on it. 
you know, you know it's, it's when, when I talk to my friends and, and I've been on panels before, I, I tell people, you know, minorities want the same thing as everybody else, right? We want good schools. We want safe neighborhoods. We want to raise our kids uh, the best we can. We want to be just treated equal, treated. We're not asking for anything, you know, extra, anything like that. We just want to, want to be treated like human beings. And, and I have a saying, and you guys tell me if, if, if you disagree with this, Glenn. When I think of white privilege, I think of to be successful in the United States of America, successful, whatever that may be, a white person can go their entire life and not have to interact with people of color. But if a black person wants to be successful, live in the best neighborhoods, the best school districts, they have to also live in the white world. And, and so hopefully that's changing, Glenn, but you know, to me that when I think of white privilege, you know, a white person can go their whole life and not interact with a black person and still be successful, make millions, do whatever. But if you're a black person, you sort of have to, you know, play by these other rules. And, and hopefully that's changing. Hopefully, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way, Glenn. But I, I feel like that's how it is at times. Yeah. Yeah. And it's um, again, you know, it's something that's 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 tough, you know, and it's something that unfortunately we have to we have to go through and deal with. You know, I know like when we step into corporate America, um, your communication skills have to be better. It has to be great. Um, you know, just et etiquette, you know, whatever you might be doing, everything has to be top notch, you know. And then like Ty said a little bit earlier is it's unfortunate, you know, when you are a black man and, and you do um, things the right way or you, you step in that corporate world, unfortunately, you're going to have your other brothers and sisters that, that look at you a certain way um, for for either making it or for having to do it that way. Um, you know, and, and that's the craziest part where it's just this constant cycle of um, you see that throughout America. You know, you see uh, people who do make it out, out the hood and they go to maybe a better area and um, they have a nicer car and do things. And, um, you know, it, it begins a cycle um, that we haven't been able to get out of, you know, and I think that um, it's unfortunately unfortunate how we have to do things. And I was just uh, reading a story about, you know, a black woman stepping into corporate America. Um, she comes to work. And, and people felt the need to touch her, to touch her hair, you know, and with a black woman, you know, that's the thing that's, that's very serious <laughs> to us anyways. It's like, you don't do that. That's just like yeah. touching a, a radio. But, um, <laughs> you know, the fact that people felt the privilege or the, the need because her hair looked different or was curled up, that they wanted to touch it and wanted to uh, have a certain type of interaction that wasn't right. Uh, with her, you know, it's it's just different. You know, it's something that wouldn't be accepted if we did it back. You know, it wouldn't be accepted um, if, if we showed up to work and, and did those things. You know, um, so it's it's just a very uh, it's a it's a different type type of um, thing that you have to deal with, and I think that we all go through it at some point. Kyle, before you before you move on, I I think a, a great part to what you were just talking about. Um, you know, we were talking about the professional world, right? Like, uh, you know, I think th there's this comment that's made all the time. It's like, he speaks really well. <laughs> right. right. We've all got that, right? Right. Exactly. Like, what does that really mean? What does yeah. really well mean? You've never heard that say to a white person, ever. Yeah. You know? Right. And, it, and I hate, I hate when I, it, even sometimes I, I might even, like, like, I'll talk to, like, Glenn, for example, right? He's not very well-spoken. You know, uh, awesome guy. Like when I first met him, right? And I and I had a full conversation, a full dialogue with him. I'm like, man, this this is this, like really refreshing. Like this guy, like you know what I mean? Really, he yeah. like I, I didn't. I remember talking to my girl. I'm like, did I just say he speaks well? Like I hate that <laughs> I even said that. You know, like I I hate that that's even a, a part of my mind even right, right. like see that. Like I I I hate that. And and I think there's so many things in the professional world. Like you're talking about hair, right? Like when you hear like the like the no dreadlocks or, or something like that, like like that that's borderline cross. You know what I mean? Like I think that's offensive to a point. Like what does that mean? Like you're taking like to a point that that could mean like like don't be too black. You know what I mean? Like you can't be too black. Right. Like, you gotta you know what I mean? Come with a a a, a buzz cutter or some straight like like that's a professional haircut, but dreadlocks aren't professional, right? Like yeah. I think those are those are things that 
you know, you have to create conversation behind. And I feel like we are going that way is where some companies are starting to say, you know what, this is this is offensive. Like we can't do that anymore. That can't be us. And and I, I do think that what's been going on in our country is allowing us to create that conversation and, and create change. Right. Let, let me ask you, Glenn, uh, about something you brought up because I, I feel like the more success you have, you, you get it from both sides, right? You, you know, you get it from your, your people's back in the neighborhood and you also get it, uh, you know, uh, from the majority out here. Uh, I had this conversation with my best friend a, a few months ago. It's like, when you do become successful, you do want the good schools. You do want the safe neighborhoods. But then you also feel like, dang, what about my hood, you know, like where I was born and raised? And, you know, we've talked about white privilege. Those are things white people don't have to think about. But as, as young African-American men, Glenn and Ty, you know, when you think about that, does that cross your mind at all? Like, you know, I, I want the best schools. I want safety. But then I don't want to be viewed as a guy that's left my neighborhood either. Like, how do you balance that? And the fact that we even have to balance it shows the kind of burden we're carrying out there. Yeah. Um, so I have a foundation uh, that empowers fathers and, and youth. And, you know, part of my uh, mission or what I want to do is to take it back to Gary, Indiana. Um, our base is in Indianapolis, but to take it to Gary, Indiana and start to introduce uh, more financial literacy classes and more things that could teach um, to teach us. You know, uh, we don't we don't know those things. We aren't taught those things in school. And, you know, I think the things that can elevate us and take us to the next level, um, we can't look for someone else to teach us that, you know, and I think that that's um, where I see it is that, uh, you know, I didn't learn about taxes. I didn't learn how to write a check. I didn't learn how um, to mortgage my house. I didn't learn anything valuable or, or, or life lessons that I would need to carry on or to get myself out of that position, to get ourselves out of, out of the hood. You know, and when you make it, like you said, unfortunately, it is both sides of things. Um, you know, but what I learned is, uh, you know, one, you can't help everybody, but the people that we can help, you know, and, and, and people who are willing to help themselves um, are, are going to be the most successful. And when you start to get uh, some of that success, you know, I think giving back in the right ways um, like that, you know, can help uh, more than anything. So that's just one of my goals to start to teach kids the things that can help take them out of the hood themselves, um, because everybody does want a handout when you get when you when you make it and you become successful. And if you don't give it to them, you know, they, they, they might have something bad to say about you. Uh, so unfortunately, you can't help everybody, but trying to help the most we can. Right. And Glenn, your foundation, Angels Are Real Indeed, uh, ARI Foundation, named after your daughter, Ariana, uh, doing great work, no doubt about it. Uh, Ty, uh, we got a question uh, that somebody submitted uh, to us, and the question is, what do you think the Sacramento Kings as an organization are doing for social justice that other organizations you'd like to see do as well? Like, how, is, how are the Kings being leaders when it comes to stuff like this? Yeah, you know, I think just uh, creating dialogue from the top to the bottom, right? I think that uh, when I first got here, I had to learn about the organization, right? And I think what's, a, what's awesome to me is, um, you know, when the marches for George Floyd were going on, uh, Vivek was there, right? He, he, was, he was there, he was in it. Like, he, wasn't, he wasn't just watching his players go and, 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 and watching African-Americans and his organization go. He was a part of it, you know, he was in it. And I think that's the most important thing uh, for any organization is to have it from the top down, right? Like I think when you see it from the top, it encourages everybody on the way down, right? Like the same way on the court, when our top guys like De'Aaron or Harrison, when they have good games, that makes us all wanna have good games, right? When they're hustling on defense, we wanna hustle on defense. It's the same thing here. Like it, it goes from the top down and like Vivek takes a stand, Monty, uh, Coach Lou, it, it, it's everybody, you know, they, they stand up for what's right. And I, I think that that's the most important thing is that when player, young players like me or just anybody in our organization, players or coaches or anything, see, see it coming from the top down, that encourages them and they want to uh, also take a part of that. And I think uh, that that's the most important thing is, is everybody in the organization uh, being a part of it. What about you, Glenn? Because you, you, you've played for a couple of other teams. Were, were you surprised at, at the way the organization 
uh, handle social justice issues, you know, after the Stephon Clark uh, murder, you know, the vet right out there in the opening. Uh, voting, opening up Golden One Center to voting. Were you shocked or surprised or how did that make you feel to see that the owner was at the forefront? Yeah, I think that that's, that's huge. You know, that's, that's a major key, a major step. You know, um, you talked about the voting. That's something that I, that I haven't seen. Um, you know, and I think doing doing things like this, being able to, to have um, us players, you know, and staff as well, be able to talk about these issues, be able to open up and express how we really, really feel about, it. you know, um, a lot of people know that we show up on game nights at 730, um, but they might not know about the practice, the other work that we put in or the beliefs that we may believe in and everything else, you know, that we go through on a, on a daily, you know, and I think that. Um, it's important for us to be able to, to show, you know, who we really are, what we really stand for and believe. Um, so I think uh, more of this, you know, and, and even like yesterday, I'm chilling on the couch and, and, and the King sent us um, a list of Sacramento, you know, black owned restaurants to, to order food from, you know, online and uh, things like that, you know, and I think that that's, um, that's most exciting, you know, and I think that th those are things that we could continue doing throughout our teams, throughout our communities is, um, sharing that knowledge and sharing that that expression of, of love for our black community. Shout out Fixins. Fixins. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fixins is, Fixins that is the spot. I've been there like <laughs> 10 times already, no doubt about it. Yo, what is that? The raspberry uh, the, uh, butter that they put on the, the, the rolls and everything, man? Yep. The Fixins is the spot. The sweet tea. Uh, you brought up uh, black businesses, Glenn, and, and I'll start with you on this. Why is it important not for just people that look like us to support black businesses. Cause I feel like a lot of times this, you know, support black businesses is only applies to us. Like why should our allies also go out there and support black businesses? Well, one, I think for years we've been, we've been doing it, you know, for them, you know, and, and I think that now that we start to uh, <laughs> empower ourselves, we start to make these businesses, we start to make these moves and, and really learn the game, you know, in a lot of different ways. Um, I think that, it's time, you know, it's time to support. And I think that that's the right thing that, that should be done, you know, and I, I think uh, more than ever, we want to see some of these businesses become successful. You know, I think that um, there's multiple, multiple places in every city that no one knows about. You know, I know I, I hadn't heard of 10 places on that list, you know, and I think that I just think about how those, those people might be struggling during these times with the pandemic. Um, I know everybody with a small business right now is struggling. Um, you know, and I think that the more that we can help our communities and, and, and really stay true, um, it's important. Ty, what can our allies do to help us out? You know, it's not all on us to go out there. You know, <laughs> the oppressed shouldn't have to be the only ones fighting this fight, man. Yeah, I, I, I think just anything, anything that anything uh, will help, really. You know, I think that um, to, to some point, if you can't, if you're not, if you can't go out there and and buy something from these companies or or these businesses, it it don't cost nothing to share share something on social media, right? It doesn't cost anything to put it on your Instagram story or share it on Facebook, right? Or retweet a tweet or anything like that. It doesn't cost money, you know. I, I feel like just anything they can help to to bring attention and bring awareness, uh, because like Glenn said, a lot of people don't know about these places, right? They they could be in areas where. Uh, are some of our allies have never won't even refuse to go to you know like it could be because again that goes back to you know African Americans live here and uh, and and white people live here it, it's just how it is and uh, I think just being able to create that conversation because you could find some really ge some gems really you know in, in multiple right. multiple different ways you know whether that's clothing or, or or some really good food or or anything like that you know I, I think just it gives people the ability to be seen and. Uh, I think that's the most important thing is just the ability to uh, be be recognized, right? Like I think that's right. Thing. If I could yeah. add one thing to that too, yeah. you know, I would I would say that you know lately I, I hear uh, a lot about like what can I do? How can I help? You know, I feel bad. You know, these are ways that you can help because uh, to me, you know, um, a lot of people might think that we're asking for handouts right now or we're asking. Um, we're not asking for for a handout. You know, we're asking for your support. We're asking for, um, you know, the same rights as you. We're asking, you know, the, the the simple, the small things that make us American and make us humans too. You know, and I think that that's the first step to just getting to see um, who we really are. You know, our culture, um, things that we believe in, 
and, and culture is a big one for me because throughout history, a lot of black culture has been lost. You know, I know um, a lot for generations and generations, like we don't have the same cultures. I know my family um, might not have like a, a dance or, or, or certain things that we do on, on different occasions. And I, I just look to where, see where our, our culture and our roots um, are and are from, you know, and as much as we can pour, you know, um, and as much as we can share about our culture, things that we believe in and things that we do on a daily basis, I think the better. And, and you know, because it starts with just being educated, it starts with seeing who we really are. Yeah, no doubt, you know. Black culture is the culture. Black culture is the culture more than anything, right, right. you know, and <laughs> music or, and everything, you know, it's it's everywhere. And I, and yeah, you like, like you like you like some of our culture, you might as well get all of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, not just, don't just enjoy our music and you know steal our dances. You might as well, you might as well support exactly, the business too. You know exactly. what I'm saying? And, and, and Ty, you brought up. Uh, I was reading uh, an article on Undefeated about Black History Month, and I know we're celebrating it now, but why does it have to be a month, bro? You know what I mean? And I know you spoke about this. Uh, just speak more about that. You know. To me, black history should be year round. You know, black history is American history. You know, don't don't just segment us, you know, in 28 days in February. We are part of American history. And so Ty, speak to that also, man. Uh man, I, I think it's ridiculous, right? I I, I always I, I wanted to tweet this, but I didn't because you know, context is everything, right? How you deliver delivery is means a lot. I wanted to say, like, when is white history month? When is it? Because I just want to know. When do we celebrate just our white heroes? You know, it's not it, it's not a thing. You know what I mean? We're expected to celebrate it year round, so I don't understand why there's, uh, you know, a month to to celebrate African Americans. And that's how I feel as an African American man, right? I feel like it it should be celebrated year round. And not only is it one month, it's also the shortest month. Right. There's, there's, I I I feel like there's really volumes to that. But it, I do. There is part of me who does uh, who does enjoy Black History Month because it, it gives time to shine light on people who don't get that attention or get that love year round. You know what I'm saying? Like there are Black heroes that are celebrated, you know, all the time, right? When you see a, a Black man and a white man hanging out, right? Like it's like Martin Luther King or it's Malcolm X or uh, a Black a Black uh, athlete taking a stand, it's Muhammad Ali, right? It's it, it, those are black heroes that are always uh, recognized, but but when, or Jackie Robinson, right, or something like that. But when we get here, when we get to February. It's a time when when the whole country, um, you know, white people in in specific, uh, acknowledge these the, these these African American heroes are more acknowledged. And I do appreciate that, but I also feel like it should be year round, right? right. I feel like it, it should be a conversation that we have all the time. But um, you know, while we are here, while we do have it. Uh, I'm gonna enjoy every minute of it. I'm yeah, gonna yeah. as much as I can, you know, because I still feel like we all have more that we can learn, right? There's still African American heroes that don't we don't know about, right? That they're never spoken about, that we don't even know that that deserve acknowledgement and deserve to be known, like because he invented this or he's the reason we do that, or there's so many things. Because again, like I said, black culture is the culture, you know. So I I do feel like. Uh, it, it's a time where we have the ability to go and uh, create those conversations and learn and, and educate ourselves. But I do wish it was a year round. Yeah, you know, it's people always say, well, what can I do to help? Well, I, I know in, in my whole household, you know, my wife is white, but we make it a point to buy books depicting African Americans in a positive light, you know? And so, you know, Underground Bookstore, I don't know if you guys checked that one out yet, right around the corner from Fixin's, Black-owned bookstore, great bookstore. So go out there and don't just buy your kids white dolls. You know, go out there, don't just buy them books featuring white characters, you know, make it a multi-ethnic thing. Uh, we do have a question, Glenn, uh, from our, our, our viewers, people watching. Uh, what do you say to those who want to get involved in a conversation but don't feel comfortable doing so? Ooh, um, I would say, um, you know, if you want to be involved in a conversation, you're doing a, you're doing a courageous thing um, right there, you know, and that's, that's an act right there. And I think um, 
whether you how how you go about doing it, um, you know, I think should just be in a manner of what you believe is right. You know, and I think more than most importantly is, you know, when I see someone um, maybe arguing or talking about a situation that they don't want to talk about um, is that they just shut down, get frustrated, you know, leave out the out the conversation. And that's the worst way to end it. You know, and I think that if we can get away from some of those things and just try to be um, more open, uh, I think that 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 is is kind of key for me. Is just expressing how how open um, you know you can be in some of these conversations because it's tough. You know, it's a tough thing to do, um, especially you know uh, having a conversation with a white person and a black person. It's just y'all two. It's tough, you know. Um, but I would say just not to be afraid, not to be afraid to speak your mind because I think now more than ever um, is the time for some of these conversations. And I know too. To us, you know, us black people, we it's more than ever. We we feel a certain way when you are expressing the love and you are saying, "Hey, I do want to help. I do feel y'all pain. I do see what y'all are going through. It's not right." Um, and I think that you know, you started and lead the conversations with some of those things. I think that um, whoever you're talking to will be open as well. And I think uh, something that's also important about about that is, uh, you know, if you don't feel comfortable talking because you. You know, you don't want to say the wrong thing, right? You know, you don't know, you don't really know what to say. I think more than anything, it's important to listen, right? It's important to listen and and, and hear these people out and digest what they're saying. You know, I, I think that's the most important thing. Before you speak, before you say anything that you think could potentially lead to confrontation or or anything like that, I think the most important thing is that you listen, right? Because sometimes we just want that some when people. In, in anything, when they're talking about something that frustrates them, that angers them, they just want to be heard, right? They just want somebody to listen to them. So I think that's the most important thing that you can do is listen, right? Before and then, and then create that conversation. But um, I, I think that's a great question, and and I, I do feel like, you know, like Glenn said, you're doing a courageous thing already uh, by by even wanting to be a part of that conversation, right? And and I and I feel like the best way for us to 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 change and and grow is is to you, you have to be uncomfortable in some of these conversations but that that's what's going to change that's what's going to change the world right is the more we get uncomfortable the more we create those uncomfortable conversations the the more that we can you know if everybody does that then the world can go um you know to different places right and you know listen and have empathy too right i mean you know we're reaching out for your help you know these, these aren't just words you know these, you got to feel what we're feeling and the passion that we're speaking. A um, couple more questions here, guys. Uh, what are ways, Glenn, black Americans can use their platform to affect change when it comes to systemic racism? I, I know you brought up financial literacy and you're out there doing it. How can we fight that? How can we fight systemic racism? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it's something that's going to definitely happen, uh, have to happen collectively. You know, I, I think the, with, within ourselves, you know, um, obviously just speaking out and, and, and talking about it and trying to get the conversations moving, you know, like like a lot of things are now, um, you know, would be great. But I think um, starting to, to take um, ownership and starting to take uh, things into our own ha hands, hopefully in our families and households, um, like you mentioned, you know, um, about the about the dolls and the babies, you know, I, I give my daughter. Uh, she has some white dolls, but she got a lot, mostly black dolls. You know, she carried around a black doll all the time. So she know, um, you know, who she is, where she's coming from. Um, you know, uh, the education, you know, I, I read to my daughter, you know, um, they say that kids who are who are read to are like three times more likely to go to college and, and to learn faster and have better skills. You know, so I think looking at some of the statistics and looking at uh, some of the differences, you know, with some of this missing throughout our lives and households. You know, and I think that that's really what can elevate us and get us uh, to, to where we need to be, because honestly, I don't think that um, it's something that's just going to be given to us. It's not something that's going to be um, learned overnight, you know, and, and it definitely takes time. Right. And, and Ty, you know, the, the events of January 6th, you know, at the Capitol, you, you came out, uh, you know, some great words that you put out there. Uh, I, I could sense your frustration. Uh, at that, but there's a segment uh, of people who think, "Why should I vote? My vote doesn't matter." You know. So, uh, what's what's your response to people who say, "You know what? All politicians are the same. It's you know we can't. It'll never change." Uh, what do you say to people like that? 
Um, you know, I, I just encourage um, educating yourself. You know, I encourage diving into these things and, and really seeing how people feel, right? In in the day and age of social media, uh, some somebody with a with a check mark tweets something, and you just like, oh, okay, that's true about that person. I don't gotta back it up. He got a check mark. He wouldn't lie to me, you know. And and I I feel like that's kind of uh, I'm young, so I I would say like you know barbaric, but it's, it's it's not that. I think it's more like you know like early in like early in the 2000s when the internet became a thing, right? It was easy to just find false information. Yeah. But nowadays, if you write a report in school, right, I got to find a source and I got to find a backup source. I got to find a backup source to that, right? I can't just go to one website and be like, you know what, that, 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 yeah. it's funny. You know, so I think just continuing to educate yourself and continuing to uh, deep dive into these things. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like you got to think about everybody as an, as an entirety. And, uh, you know, with everything that's gone on in the past 12 months, I feel like. If you still have that mindset um, with everything that's going on, to me, uh, not to be like offensive to anybody, but I just felt like it was ignorant. You know, I just felt I felt like it. I encouraged my family and encouraged anybody that would l listen to me in any way. Please right. go out and vote because it not like we can't do. It's not like we can do everything, right? But we can have yeah. somewhat of a change. You know, and I feel like it, there's no better time than than now. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I thought over the last year, like I, I enjoy doing these conversations with you guys, you know, but part of me, Glenn, is like the people that I really need to hear this, they're not trying to hear it. You know what I mean? And so how do we over, how do we reach those people that, you know, if we're really talking about change, you know, part of me wants to sit down with people who see the world differently than I do. Uh, and maybe that's pie in the sky thinking. Maybe that's you know too much of a utopian idea. But how do we reach those people that you know, like John, you know, who had the comment, he wants to help. He wants to be a part of it. But how do we reach those people that's like, nah, man, this is just how it's going to be? Or do we just write them off and then say forget about it? You, I, I think you continue to do it. You know, I think we continue to. Um, to use our platforms, like Ty said, but we continue to have these conversations. We continue doing the right thing. You know, um, one person that I, I, I really respect in a black man in this world is uh, Barack Obama. You know, um, I seen the way that, that him and Michelle left office. I don't think I, I would have been able to leave office as peaceful <laughs> and as graceful as they did, you know? And I got a lot of respect for that. And what he's, and what they said, you know, was we're gonna take the high route. We're gonna act appropriately, properly, you know, not act, um, you know, with disrespect, like like we've seen throughout the past couple of months, like how they ran on Capitol. Um, you know, if that was us, it wouldn't have went the same way. And I think, like Ty said, is continue to educate ourselves, you know, even though, you know, I think Black, we all think Black History Month shouldn't just be this month. Um, you know, I take this month to really educate myself and even learn about more people, more African-Americans that I didn't know about, about my ancestors, about people um, who I can learn from. Um, I'm a big car guy. Like I was just reading before this call, uh, George Carver, Washington, I believe, um, had the first automotive um, company, black owned uh, car company um, back in the day. And uh, a black guy invented the, excuse me for uh, not knowing his name, invented the turn signal. Another black guy invented um, the yellow light. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I educate myself and try to do um, more learn about more people throughout this month, but you know, throughout the other months as well. But I really take this time um, because you can see it everywhere. You can see it right now through on Instagram. You scroll, there should be Black History Month going. So try to take advantage of that for those who don't know as much um, about this and our culture and about these things and uh, continue to educate yourselves with, with conversations. And the biggest thing, if you don't know what else to do, go back and watch some of the tapes of what's happened throughout the last months. Go back, and if that doesn't make you sick, you know, I don't know what will. If that doesn't make you want to change, um, you know, that's that's hard, and it's probably because of how you were raised. But I do love um, the things that we're doing in, in throughout our, our society right now, and having these talks and really educating people. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, I, I guess I, I want to wrap it up by, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter, Tyrese. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's sort of become, you know, a phrase, an organization that's been misappropriated by a lot of people, you know. 
Uh, some people think it's one thing when it really means other. When, when I say Black Lives Matter, what does that mean to you? Put that into context for me. Yeah, I feel like uh, people have tried to turn it into multiple different things, uh, tried to relate it to the organization um, of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, to be honest, I don't, I don't really know too much about the organization, but I do know that that term holds a lot of weight to me um, because it's an obvious thing. Right, like, like Black Lives do matter. Right, I, I feel like that's pretty obvious, but I feel like we had to put it in the most simple terms, you know what I mean, for people to truly understand what we're saying, right? And and I, I feel like um, people are always gonna try to twist things and turn them into different, to different things, right? Like the the comeback to Black Lives Matter is always all lives matter, <laughs> and it's like that's not the that's not what no, that's not what we're saying. Nobody's saying that that they don't. That, that that all lives don't matter. We're trying to put emphasis on that black lives do because at, there are at, at times, at multiple times throughout a year, uh, it, it, or just throughout time, right? That us as as people, we felt like they don't. That black lives don't. They don't matter as much. So I think we just put it in the most simple terms that we could that they do matter just as much as any other life, right? And I think that's important to to create dialogue about. And, and people are gonna, of course, people are gonna try to turn in different things. All lives matter, blue lives matter, you know, all that nonsense, right? But I, I do think that Black Lives Matter means a lot to me because it's putting it in the most simple terms that everybody should be able to understand, right? Nobody, we didn't make it, I, I wouldn't make it hard for anybody to understand, right? Like my, my, my four-year-old uh, niece, she understands what that means, right? She knows that means that Black Lives do in fact matter. So it, it, it means a lot to me. and I. Yeah, people are going to try to turn it a different way, but I feel like uh, uh, that 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 if you really know and really are educated about this and this really matters to you, you know how much that, that means. How about you, Glenn? What does it mean to you, man? Like Ty said, it's, it's very simple words, and I think that it means stop killing us, stop disrespecting us, you know, and treat us, treat us human, like human beings, like you would treat you all. And I think that, you know, it's, it's very, very simple. And it's something that we're unfortunately gonna have to continue to say, you know, uh, and like Ty said, you know, most of the time black lives haven't been valued, haven't been valued the same and have means the same to all of us. And it, and it needs to, you know, and I think uh, it's something that just, I hold very strong, um, you know, and it's crazy that we have to wear it on a shirt for people to understand those simple terms of what we're asking for. Um, so, you know, all I ask and all I want is uh, that term to be taken seriously and for people to understand that um, we are humans, you know, we have that same right to live and black people are most powerful people on, on, on this earth, you know, and I think that once, you know, you continue to educate yourself and you continue to see um, we're all equal and hopefully we can get to that point. Right, right. And, and you know, one of the things that bothers me, guys, you know, and you guys have heard it a, a hundred times, the whataboutisms that go on in our country. Well, what about what's happening in Chicago, Glenn? What about what's happening in inner city Philly? You know, and, and the thing that people don't understand is people are marching every single week in those cities. People are trying to make change every single week in those cities. Glenn, you got your organizations. You're out there trying to make a difference. Just because it's not on CNN or MSNBC don't mean it ain't happening out there. Don't mean that people aren't fighting a good fight out there. And so that, that bothers me, Glenn, when people say, well, what about this? What about that? Uh, speak to, if you can, just the work your organization is doing and, and, and what you've seen from other, other organizations. Because people are out there fighting a good fight, man. Yeah, yeah, we are. You know, And I think that uh, people need to know that. So my foundation, Angels Are Real Indeed, um, we empower fathers and provide assistance to fatherless families. You know, not having a father in the home is one of the um, biggest things for our, our American families in general, but especially black families. That's one of the biggest problems, um, you know, and, and to try to help that, I've used my voice and it started in the bubble. Um, I actually got two uh, grassroots organizations from Gary, Indiana, and, and they, they provide help and assistance uh, in Gary for people to go there. Um, whether they need books, clothes, uh, we provide a Christmas presents and I also do events throughout the community uh, for all of the major holidays, uh, Father's Day uh, and different give backs to the communities. Um, got a scholarship giveaway coming up soon in February. 
and we help one one family a month uh, that's fatherless and, and try to get them uh, in a better position and better homes. And I think that, you know, if we can start small, we expand and, and I see this company growing and, and getting bigger and, and, and it being a true not-for-profit. Not that's why I started it. I didn't want anything to come to me. I wanted to help my community where I'm from. Also, every team that I play on, I help out in that city. Um, so I, I'm definitely looking looking forward to getting uh, Ty's help uh, here in Sacramento and, and helping out some people through my organization. Yeah, you know, one of the things, you know, giving out turkeys during Thanksgiving, Glenn, I know you did that as well. Uh, before we wrap it up, guys, Ty, what's your message to people at home watching? What are we asking people to do out there? Um, you know, continue to create conversation. Uh, I know I've said that probably a hundred times already on this call, but right. I think that's the most important thing. Um, continue to create those conversations and have those conversations uh, because it starts. It just it starts with one. You can change one person's mind, right? You don't got to change. Nobody's asking you to change fifty, change a hundred. Just, just it starts with one person, right? And we just grow from there. So continue to have conversations. Continue to have those uncomfortable conversations. Uh, that might be you stepping out of your comfort zone, but um, it's, it's not. And say, and if those people don't believe that change can happen now, that's not what's important, right? Think about your kids and your grandkids and, and, and down the line um, that when you're not here anymore, that you played a part in having a lasting impact uh, on this world. So just continue to create conversation. And um, yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, what about you, Glenn? What do you want people to take away from this, man? Yeah, I would just say, you know, my, my personal experience, have, having a daughter, you know, I'll say it once again, having a daughter, and, 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 and I'm going to have to explain some of these situations and some of these events that have occurred throughout the past year or two, um, you know, just same way that, that my mother and grandma and dad had to do with me. Um, and it's very unfortunate, you know, so how about we stop? We stop that. We stop some of the trauma, and it's um, we can get it done together. You know, it's going to take time. Like Ty said, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in um, a couple of weeks. But this is things where I want my daughter to grow up in a better society. I want uh, her children, you know, and, and, and generations to come to grow up better and have it better than, than what we did. Like Ty said earlier, you know, Dr. King, starting with him, if he was here today, I truly believe what Ty said to be true. Like he would would see that we have another level to go to. We have another right. a different place uh, to go to. And I think now it's about um, getting us in, 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 in more places together. You know, it went from black versus white. Now let's try to elevate uh, because we can, we can find a way to do it. Um, and it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be ideal, uh, but this change can't happen. You know who is crazy guys? Well, basically what we're talking about is equal rights versus not like, Who's against equal rights? You know what I mean? Like, think about it. At, at, at the basic, you know, uh, the bottom level of it, we're talking about equal rights. And if you're against that, man, that's, you know, uh, what can we do? What can we do, fellas? Uh, you know, like, equal rights. That's what, you know, that's what we're asking for. All right, boys. Uh, you know, we got 20-year-old Tyrese Halliburton, 27-year-old Glenn Robinson III, speaking knowledge, dropping facts. Fellas, I appreciate it so much. Thank you, uh, thank you guys for coming on. It's a very important uh, panel. I know you guys got a game to prepare for. You got Denver and the Clippers. You know, if I was you, I probably wouldn't get any sleep because those are two heavyweights. But I know you boys will be ready, man. Looking forward to seeing you guys on the court soon. Yeah, appreciate you very much. Thank you, Thank guys. you so much. We appreciate it. All right, Tyrese and Glenn, that'll wrap it up for Perspective, our conversation with Tyrese Halliburton and Glenn Robinson III. Thanks, everybody out there behind the scenes that helped put this on as well. And thank you guys for watching and for leaving so many comments. I got to check them out. I saw them all out there. Thanks so much. We will be doing this more often, no doubt about it, because like Tyrese said, Black History Month shouldn't just be a one-month thing. We'll continue this conversation throughout the season. I'm Kyle Draper. I'll see you soon on the next Kings broadcast.